Good morning. Would you pray with me, please? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. This past Wednesday, during our weekly staff meeting here at the church, Natalie Scott gave the devotion. Members of the staff take turns sharing a devotion to open our meetings. Natalie read from My Utmost for His Highest, the beloved devotional book by Oswald Chambers. The reading for that day pertained to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, where the Apostle Paul writes, My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom. Oswald Chambers explicated this text by noting that the gospel, not the preacher, should make an impression on the listener. To drive home the point, he said, real and effective fasting by a preacher is not fasting from food, but fasting from eloquence, from impressive diction, and from everything else that might hinder the gospel of God being presented. While I certainly see and understand his argument, I did do some mental gymnastics as Natalie read these and other words that sounded to me at first that Chambers was championing mediocrity. He was not, of course, but I was a little concerned that someone might construe his words that way. I believe that any preacher or anyone working for the church, for that matter, has an obligation to aim for excellence because he or she is in service to God. It's an expectation I have of myself and of our staff. So sermons, for example, should not be sloppy and so devoid of eloquence as to reflect less than a full and sincere effort to do one's very best at communicating the good news of Jesus Christ. I realize I've just set myself up for lots of criticism or at least ribbing when it comes to my preaching. But all kidding aside, if we're serving the Lord, then we ought to be motivated to give our best, to throw ourselves into what we're doing. And this applies not just to paid church staff, but to volunteers as well. All of us should give our all in Christian service, whatever form it might take. You could say that that's part of the message of the parable of the Good Samaritan, which immediately precedes today's text from the Gospel of Luke and which we studied last Sunday. The Samaritan is lifted up as an example of being a true neighbor to the man lying half dead in the ditch because he exhibited selfless love and compassion. He went way over the top in the level of care and generosity he showed toward this stranger who ordinarily would be seen as his enemy. I would say that the Samaritan acted with excellence in what he did for the man on the side of the road. So excellent, in fact, as to humble or even embarrass us. On a more positive note, he inspires us to do more in service to Christ in fulfilling the second half of Jesus' two-part great commandment to love God with your all and to love your neighbor. Today's story about Martha and Mary is, according to commentators, the other side of the coin, a lesson on the first part of the great commandment on how to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. But if both stories support the proposition that when loving God and loving our neighbor, we should do so with excellence, with our all, in other words, why is Martha criticized when she certainly does seem to be giving her all in being hospitable to Jesus? Hospitality is a biblical virtue, especially venerated in the Near East then and now. And her guest was none other than the Son of God. So why isn't she, rather than her sister Mary, held up as a paragon of virtue? Apparently it's a matter of focus. There's the old expression, a watched pot never boils. It's a maximum, it's a maximum encouraging patience, of course. But within it is the idea that we can pay attention to the wrong things things that don't help or move us toward our goals. Evidently, that's what Martha was doing. 
Like the parable of the Good Samaritan, this story about Martha and Mary has some interesting social issues underlying the main action. Luke says that while Jesus and his disciples were on their way to Jerusalem, that is, they arrived in a certain village where Martha welcomed them into her home. Martha and Mary may very well have been the same two sisters of Lazarus featured in the Gospel of John and thus residents of Bethany just outside of Jerusalem, but there's no mention of their brother or of any man in the house. So this was, a rather, radi this was rather radical for a woman in that day and time to be welcoming a group of men into her home. She had to be brave because people would talk. As I mentioned a moment ago, hospitality was a big deal then and there. The Torah reminded the people of Israel that they were once sojourners, strangers in the land, so they should love the aliens among them, giving them food and clothing. <clears throat> in the Near East, that meant pulling out all the stops. You'd lavish your guests with food and kindness. Jesus may have been a close friend of the family, but that didn't make him this occasion any less special. Whether or not Martha yet understood Jesus to be the Messiah at that point, certainly she knew him as a great rabbi, thus making him an honored guest. It wasn't going to be mac and cheese on the table that night. Complicating things for Martha was the likelihood that she had little or no warning of Jesus' arrival. He couldn't have phoned or texted in advance that he and his followers were on the way. Word got to Martha when Jesus arrived in the village. You wonder what went through her mind right after she extended the invitation to Jesus, maybe mild panic, as she realized she had to run to the market for at least some of the food she would serve. The house would have to be cleaned, the table had to be set, and the oven had to be fired up as she prepared her specialty and many other foods, too. The meal would be cooking while the guests waited so as to be warm when served to them. You can just imagine the flurry of activity in that kitchen. And she had to be at least a little anxious, not just because of the time pressures, but also because of who her main guest was. Joy Jordan Lake writes in the Christian Century about how difficult it would have been to have Jesus as a guest in your home. She writes, here's the thing, Jesus makes me nervous. God Almighty is one thing, but Jesus makes me uncomfortable. Jesus would make everyone uncomfortable as far as I can tell. Imagine asking him home for lunch. Not only does he not lend a hand in setting the table or pouring the drinks, he's got your other would-be helpers spellbound at his feet, imbibing the profundity of the ages while the pot roast withers and the salad wilts. How does one prepare for Jesus' visit? Would you clean the house more thoroughly than usual? Or let's be honest, would you clean the house for a change? Would excessive cleanliness suggest that you'd been neglecting some spiritual advancement opportunities? Would you borrow fine china to show your deep and abiding respect for the Messiah or use paper plates to symbolize an equally deep and abiding lack of interest in material goods? Would you impress him more with a menu featuring Maine lobster, an edible version of pouring perfume at his feet? Or would you fare better slapping peanut butter and jelly on the cheapest bread, calculating carefully the money you save in buying groceries for a homeless family you'd befriended. Jesus might praise either choice or condemn either. He might say, good and faithful servant, or you whitewashed sepulcher, depending on nasty little intangibles like motivation and intent. Jesus called them as he saw him. Public opinion swayed him no more than the stir storm-stirred winds and waves a desirable trait for a Little League umpire, but regretful lack of tack for a dinner guest. By the way, after the 8.30 service, Andrew pointed out to me that the lobster would not be kosher, and I, I appreciated that. <laughs> <laughs> See, another tricky thing about having Jesus as a dinner guest. <laughs> So Martha had plenty of reason to be nervous as she frantically worked to prepare that special meal for Jesus and the other guests in her home. 
Running through her mind must have been one task to do after another. Did I put enough spices on the meat? Is, is it cooked enough? Has anyone set the table? What about the vegetables? Somebody needs to clean them. Mary, Mary, where's Mary? Suddenly Martha must have realized that her sister Mary wasn't in the kitchen where she belonged, at least by society's standards of the day. Where was Mary? She was sitting at Jesus' feet, right in the midst of all the men who were listening to their master teach. Disciples sat at the feet of their teacher, meaning they sat attentively and learned from him. But disciples were always male. Martha likely went bug-eyed when she saw her sister sitting there with the men. You just didn't do that as a woman in those days. There was a clear, invisible line, irony intended, dividing up the world into male and female spaces, and you simply never crossed that line. The temple had the court of the women and the court of the men. Private houses were similarly divided based on the respective activities assigned to the two genders. Mary had crossed over into the men's world and their space within the household, the space where men studied scripture and learned at the feet of a rabbi. To show how frowned upon this would have been, there were some rabbis who said that burning the Torah was better than teaching it to women. Martha approached Jesus and asked him to rectify this obvious social faux pas on the part of her sister. Actually, she basically demanded that he fix it, even trying to shame Jesus for not caring that her sister had left her with all the work to do by herself. Ironically, she was the one guilty of the greater faux pas for mistreating her guests this way, a terrible breach of hospitality. She didn't realize it, though, as she was caught up in her own hurt. She was so busy trying to keep everything in the house in its right place as she prepared for dinner, and that included her sister, who was with the men where she didn't belong, and not in the kitchen with her where she was supposed to be in Martha's ordered world. Martha expected Jesus to share her indignation regarding Mary's behavior, but to her disappointment, he did not. Instead, Jesus let Martha know that Mary was right where she belonged, and it was the same place that Martha belonged to if she had had her priorities in the right order. Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part which will not be taken away from her. Jesus would not be bound and shackled by society's chains of oppression against women. In God's kingdom, which he was ushering in, all persons were welcomed as citizens with full and equal rights of participation, women as well as men, poor as well as rich, infirm as well as healthy, Gentiles as well as Jews. Jesus was ushering in a new order, one governed by love for all people. And he still is. He still is. Martha's concern regarding her sister probably wasn't only that she was with the men. It was also likely due to the fact that she was there and therefore not in the kitchen helping Martha. This had nothing to do with gender. It had to do with the need of the moment in her eyes. In other words, Martha felt that Mary was ignoring what was most important, the work of hospitality, and thus of God's kingdom by feeding and sustaining its workers. Martha was all about doing, while to her Mary seemed to be too prone just to thinking and adoring. Yeah, it was nice to be devoted to Jesus, but the other work still had to be done. Somebody had to do it. And it didn't do much good just to sit around and look up adoringly into Jesus' eyes. Or did it? Jesus told Martha that she was distracted by many things, but she probably didn't think she was. She had her eyes fixed squarely on what she considered of primary importance, preparing that dinner, an elaborate soiree that would impress any guest, including Jesus. As such, however, she was looking in the wrong direction and missing the big picture. Jesus, the Messiah, was in her home, spending a quiet, intimate moment with them and sharing his divine wisdom. This was not to be missed, and yet she was doing just that because her focus was off. A watched pot. There's a story from another century of a young man in need of a job who spotted an advertisement from a telegraph company seeking to hire a telegrapher. He had some familiarity with the telegraph system, so he went to apply for the position. 
As he entered the office, he was surprised to see so many others also there for the job. He took a seat but was discouraged about his chances. Suddenly, he perked up, and after a few seconds, he raced into the back office. Shortly thereafter, he emerged, having secured the job. The other applicants asked, well, how can this be? We've been waiting all this time for an interview. The young fellow responded, while I was sitting here, I heard tapping noises. When I listened closely, I heard someone typing out, can you read me? If so, then come on back because you got the job. I ran into the back room and they hired me on the spot. <laughs> Martha's problem was that she wasn't properly focused on the message being communicated right there in her house. Jesus was speaking to her and to everyone else, including every woman, but she failed to hear him. Her sister, however, did hear the tapping noises on her heart and went to their source. Jesus made it clear that it was Mary, not Martha, who got it, who was doing what was most important at the time. The meal, while a nice gesture, was not of utmost importance. Rather, it was the gathering of disciples of every kind and the sharing of love and ideas with one another that mattered more. As one writer puts it, Martha was so caught up in entertaining and providing for her guest that she had forgotten the identity of the guest. The same writer says that the parable of the Good Samaritan and the story of Martha and Mary are side by side because they're complementary, two sides of the same coin. Just as we cannot have faith without serving others, we cannot truly serve until we have sat at the feet of Jesus. We show our purest love when we know Christ best. So when we consider what's called for in Christian discipleship, we should remember it as this two-sided coin. Both sides are necessary to make the coin complete. Sometimes we need to roll up our sleeves and do things in the name of Christ. We must act on our faith for it to be alive. But there are also those times when we should stop and reflect on the words of our Savior, when we should meditate on and show our devotion to the Lord. Such prayerful contemplation also keeps our faith alive. Both sides of the coin are essential for us to be whole. By the way, I'd say that these truths apply to us not only as individual disciples of Jesus, but also to us as the church. It's not either or, but rather both and when it comes to discipleship for our congregation. We must sit at the feet of Jesus as we do in worship and prayer and Holy Communion in order to be grounded in God's word to us. And yet we as a church can't stay there forever. We are called to action in the name of Christ to share his life-giving love with a broken world, to seek justice where it is absent, to proclaim another way, the way to true life, eternal life. We are called to action, action grounded in God's heart, communicated to us, at the feet of our Savior. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.